thank you for attending um, our meeting tonight. Uh, you have to tolerate about 40 to 45 minutes my very strange accent, my strange name. So um, as you may um, know, uh, I'm, I'm Iranian, and so that's the Iranian name. But it's actually it's Arabic, but I'm Iranian. And you have to tolerate me for 40, 45 minutes. Please interrupt me, uh, add to what I want to say, correct me, ask questions. <coughs> And, uh, and make, make it interactive, because, um, because when I look at the list of um, people attended into this meeting, uh, there were uh, lawyers, data protection officers, security professionals, auditors, so um, please stop me uh, if you find anything not entirely correct, or you can add to that, that would be, that would be great, because uh, collectively we can learn more, obviously. Um, thank you for a very long speech of um, Chris's speech, it was very long. Just quickly to, uh, to add to Chris, um, Irma, we've got about two and a half thousand members. If you're a, me a member of BCS, member of Irma, please help us with the uh, work we do in, in, in that committee. So you can donate your time, your skills, your, um, your um, experience, um, which can be transferred to all members. So we, we, we will be appreciated. The, <clears throat> the trailer you, it was in the first slide, uh, is, it comes from a film called Transcend Transcendence, 2014 film, uh, which I, I, I love that film, because, because uh, Johnny Depp, as someone who put all of those data from individuals and using uh, artificial intelligence to create life, and, uh, and I, I was always fascinated to, to watch that film and ha see how um, data can create such a, such a powerful, powerful uh, uh, invention. Uh, and I, I, if you haven't watched that film, uh, I really uh, recommend uh, to watch, watch the film. It's really nice. Um, it's been one year. 25th of uh, May 2018. We had a conference here. Uh, has anyone attended our conference last year in here, in April? Well, not many of you. So, when I was thinking about that day, and we had um, deputy commissioner, ICO's commissioner here as a keynote speaker, and uh, when, I, when I was looking back, back at what he said about GDPR, um, some of the things he said never happened because what, what he said, oh, I see you do, will do this, will do that. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been a journey for all of us in terms of GDPR. So uh, I think we are in a right place now as, as one year old GDPR to kind of looking at weaknesses, strengths, pitfalls, benefits and also what we've learned. <clears throat> so obviously each of us in, in what we do in our job, everyday job, we've learned different things. Uh, the, so certain things could be similar to what we learned, but certain things could be different. But that, that's why I said, if you want to share your experience, please um, do interrupt me. So, um, the, 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 the um, the birth of GDPR was um, in the middle of explosion of data, and and I, I, I think it it, it revolutionised the way we look at data, we look at personal data. So um, whether you uh, you had a difficulty to catch up with GDPR requirements in your everyday job, whether you were a data protection act. Um, sorry, data protection um, uh, officer, whether you were a um, security professional or, um, or, or uh, working in a legal, um, legal team, you, you had a lot of difficulties. I, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can share this with you because a lot of things weren't cl uh, clear what we, we need to do. So looking at this uh, from this angle, uh, what we're looking tonight is uh, first, we are going to see how much we actually we know 
uh, did we know about GDPR, about data protection before 25th of uh, 2018? Because the last update on Data Protection Act was in 1990s, when there was no Internet of Things, when there was no cloud, when we haven't had social media at that ex extent we have today. We haven't got, we haven't had billions of end devices, uh, mobile devices, uh, and it's, it's, it's different. So, so how much we knew about all of, all of this before um, GDPR, introduction of GDPR. Then we look at new players and stakeholders. And, and quickly we look at the incidents we had. Pre-GDPR, we had security incidents. So post-GDPR, we had security incidents. So the, the whole purpose of having GDPR and, and the objective of GDPR did, did help us to bring down security incidents, to contain security incidents, to, uh, to um, address effectively personal data uh, exposed as a result of security incidents. Uh, is, it, is it true or false? Have we managed to do, the, to do this? And how, how, uh, 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 the rate of success, how was our rate of success in that, in that um, matter? So um, a, a lot of talks about GDPR fines. We look at GDPR fines. I look at, there are lots of problems, but I, I realize there are two key problems, again, back to my own experience. So I look to what are the two uh, key problems? And privacy, because privacy has got a lot of angles. It's got political angle, it's got legal ang angle, security angle. So how privacy uh, plays in its role in this? Just quickly looking at GDPR principles, just remind us what GDPR actually wanted us or wants us to do, and the, what are the basis of GDPR, and how we can manage the risk uh, around personal data, and what lesson we've learned. So at any of this stage you think you can add to this, please uh, interrupt me. So as I mentioned, GDPR is, uh, is the biggest shakeup in, uh, in uh, data protection regulations uh, since the last update we had in 1990s. And obviously we needed this. Uh, I think EU started 2010, correct me if I'm wrong, 2010 to look at uh, new regulations and eventually uh, they published 2016, am I right? Yeah, 20, 2018, it, uh, it came to, to, to into the effect and the uh, and UK government uh, actually adopted GDPR as a data protection, uh, act, new data protection act. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's a big thing because, because it, it's, it was missing in, in between, with, between of everything we achieved or everything happened in terms of technological revolution, artificial intelligence and, and our, uh, Internet of Things and big data and other, other stuff. So what, what we knew about uh, all of these things before 25th of May, are you really, how do you feel about this? Every website you go, I, I, I'm sure you're frustrated like any other. You know, every website you have a hundred times maybe. Yes, I accept it. In a very, sometimes in a very vague language, uh, you don't understand exactly. You know, it's, it's, and it comes in different different parts of the page you visit. It sometimes comes from down top sides. So um, I, I'm I'm really frustrated, and I'm not quite sure if we achieved anything from this. In my opinion. This was basically for data controllers, not data subject. This was actually what, uh, what achieved for data controllers was to say, look, we told everyone that we are doing this. And 
if you look at what data subject actually, it, the, the, the whole purpose of GDPR was, was about data subject, it's about personal individuals. So individuals don't, some of us, or most of us, maybe don't understand what, this is actually taken from ICO's website, uh, not any other website. Um, one of the things GDPR, in my uh, opinion, um, highlighted quite massively was the role of ICO as a regulator in the UK. Because um, before GDPR started the conversation, the ru ruling out of GDPR, um, maybe ICO wasn't in a place in terms of publicity as it is today. Yeah? Uh, I, I, I think I, I hear ICO more than any other time, as I correctly recalled the times of, I hear ICO. And we've got this. How many DPOs here? So three DPOs on the list, and no one's here. Okay, the, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm really, I've got all symp sympathies with these people because they have to deal with the massive, massive task in their hands. Still they're doing, I, um, I, I can't name the organization I was um, there um, a few weeks ago. They had about five ter um, petabytes of un unstructured data, five petabytes which is about 10 billion, 10 billion documents, yeah? 10 billion documents. God knows how long does it take for them to go through all of those unstructured data because the structured data is easy or easier. And how, how they can sort out that, that, that unstructured data, I'm, I'm not quite sure. How many of you dealt with paper? Not many of you, but we will come to the paper as well. Um, one of, again, my, my own experience, one of the pillar of uh, GDPR was DPIA. I think DPIA is a, is a key when you want to do the, your um, audit and risk assessment on, on personal data. It's, it's really, really important because it will answer lots of, lots of your questions. Any, any experience with DPIA? Anyone wants to share? Nothing? Uh, OK, then, oh, yeah? Um, so I worked. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, I, can, I can hold that. Thank you. Sorry. So I worked on a project, so I was from a project perspective, a change team, and when the business were asked to do undertake a DPIA, there was a lot of pushback, it was a lot of upset, why are we doing this, this is a waste of time, and trying to introduce the process of uh, you complete a DPIA, you send it into the data protection office, there's a um, you know, department and we'll review it and we'll give you feedback, not interested. The business was quite resistant to doing DPIAs. They just thought it was a waste of time. There was a very, very little buy-in. Yeah, but did you try to sell them as something they have to face in terms of the business value, the added value? Yes. Because DPIA has got lots of added value to, to the business. I think that to, to, to begin with, it was just look, seen as, look, we've got a day job. Why are we doing this? It wasn't, it wasn't looked upon as value. It was, we've been doing this before. We, can't we just carry on doing what we were doing? So it was very resistant to change. Okay. I, 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 I share your story. I think lots of, lots of people got similar, similar things to say about the whole process of DPIA, let alone DPIA, uh, sorry, the, the GDPR, let alone the DPIA on its own. Thank you for, um, for sharing that. So, yeah, we've got these, these new things, which we haven't had it. So, explosion of data. So, we, need, we needed something in terms, of, in terms of our legal backbone to address uh, personal data. Okay, pre-GDPR incidents. It wasn't really pre-pre, but it was, 
he was quite close to GDPR. So uh, I'm sure you um, remember this, this chap. And, and obviously the, the whole um, issue around uh, CA and Facebook. My favorite, Ashley Madison. Uh, so there are lots of examples. So I can't, I can't give you, um, I, I mean, you, you know, you can, you can give me a list of hundreds list of these things. But pre-GDPR, we had security incidents. We had personal data exposed, went into the public domain, and, um, and, and it happened uh, a lot. So we wanted GDPR to stop this, or help to stop it, this, or to, to assist when, if and when personal data exposed in public domain, we know where this data come from, whose data is this, where it was and what purposes they were used. So we, all of these questions, we uh, supposedly we we, sh we should have known, or we we are supposed to know because of GDPR structure and framework. So, so, yeah, so you raised a really interesting point, which is how was it before? Has it got better? But was that what? I'll just challenge you in my in my own mind. Was that what? GDPR was intended to do? Was it really trying to stop bad people doing bad things? Or was it trying to help good people do good things properly? Yeah, good good point. I think I think GDPR, the intention of GDPR wasn't to stop security incidents. I think GDPR wanted to create a framework if personal data exposed to public domain, organization they had no clue how many people, people data exposed. They had no clue what sort of data gone out. They still don't have a clue, yeah? <laughs> but the, the GDPR wanted to, to give a, a, a best practice of handling a data, a personal data and, and data management process. So there's another thing about GDPR Thanks, John. That GDPR put forward a requirement that you had to be notified that the that data had been released, whereas previously organisations hid it under the carpet. Thank you. That's a very good point. Yeah, seventy-two hours. You have to um, inform the regulator. You've been um, if you if you find out uh, you have been breached. So you have to you have to tell them. But the, the whole point of this is, we, this is what pre GDPR. So are we still doing s exactly similar things after introduction of GDPR? Has GDPR actually had any impact the way we deal with a breach of personal data? Uh, that, that's the that's the question. That's that's something we need to concentrate on. That. So I've been. We haven't been successful, as far as I know, but if we're doing better, we've got a lot of um, um, improvement. We, uh, we've made a lot of changes in our, the way we handle personal data, but it wasn't completely success, successful. So um, the security incidents kept happening. They keep happening. So uh, lots of, lots of uh, lists and lots of... Um, Names we can we can add to this. Uh, well, American companies, but they've got massive, massive global um, um, business, and, and GDPR is about EU citizens. Uh, and 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 also the we've got EU breaches, fifty nine thousand apparently uh, in the last eight months, fifty nine thousand. So. The question, again, is not whether we uh, try to use GDPR <laughs> to stop security breaches. The question is how the best practice been implemented, how we deal with data management in a way we used to do it differently. So, sorry, can yeah, I, sorry. 
if, if I can raise another point, sure. I, I wonder whether another interesting question is, has it changed the behaviour of organisations now there is a right to, uh, sorry, not a, a requirement to notify. So, so you listed a, a number of those incidents up there. Would we have heard about so many of those if it hadn't have been for some of these requirements? And it's not just GDPR, because some of those requirements are coming in other countries, but, mm. but would we have heard about quite as many of these things if they weren't compelled to tell people? Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. That, that's what you wonder. Absolutely. You know, or, you know, or, or, good, good point. You know, and, and are they using this, you know, just to sort of get it out there, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. And, and, and also a lot of, um, in terms of global regulations, a lot of overlaps between China's got its own privacy policy uh, regulations, which introdu they introduced 2016, and, and California has got its own uh, uh, privacy uh, compliance, which is, which is all of this. Um, as you just said, whether whether this has actually changed the behavior of uh, of, of firms, organizations, or how that impacted is 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 quite interesting to 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 watch and see how 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 we've done. So that sorry, sorry, go on. Uh, I, so I just wanted to um, raise a thought that has occurred to uh, myself and, and where I work. I've just background. I'm a I'm one of the few uh, lawyers in the room, um, so I come from a kind of legal and tech, tech perspective. Um, and you know, we, we're a regulatory technology firm which produce kind of automated data privacy software. And um, for us, we've kind of been waiting for these things to be handed down, GDPR fines, for evidence of sub substantive enforcement uh, action. And um, there hasn't been a huge amount, right? Um, and uh, Thank you. You just came to, to my point. Thank you. But I just want to link back into the security breach point, right? Yeah. So, so you know, when I talk, when I've spoken to lawyers who've worked on who are working on active ICO investigations and also try and read between the lines of actually dealing with the ICO itself, it seems to me there's a reasonably good chance that uncovering all those security breaches, the fifty nine thousand plus across the whole of the EU, um, has somewhat capsized the regulators. As they're kind of gearing up to, and I apologise, there's an ICO person in the room here. I'm not <laughs> not looking to cast aspersions, but so I want so so there's so there's a tension there in my mind, right? Sorry, it's a rather long point, but there's a tension there in that the the uncovering of the security breaches um, has a effect on the ability of that regulator to conduct investigations and enforcement action more regularly, right? So it's great that we may be seeing more security breaches. But because of the drain on resources exerted by that, it is quite likely that we're seeing less enforcement action than we otherwise would do. And there needs to be a balance between the two, because without enforcement action, the regulation, quite frankly, becomes toothless and eventually useless. Very, very good point. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Sorry? There's more than 100,000 people and this kind of data maybe uh, then we'll impose fines. Because, I mean, that, that's very very good 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 point. Thank you. Um, it's just um, again because because it's one of those topics which we it, from a legal perspective, security perspective, from an organizational commercial perspective, it's quite confusing. Still a lot of confusion around GDPR and a lot of lot of. Uh, a misunderstanding, a, a lot of mishandling of understanding of G GDPR at the same time, and I I, um, I concur with your uh, with your assessment on that. Yeah, in, in addition to this, now we are having a very exponential kind of network where we target the firm and all of the outsourced entities, and you know, either be the big and small. So having making sure that those players are having you know our kind of information and handling it properly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I I totally agree. So another thing which I think is interesting is the number of individuals who have been fined since GDPR. So it's not just companies; it's the individual yeah. who did something wrong. So if you have done something wrong, you have looked at. Um, patient data with your sister's patient data, you're a nurse, you've looked at your patient data, 
but you are then being fined. And okay, the amount may not be huge, mm -hmm. but you've got a couple of thousand pounds fine plus court fees. So that's three thousand pounds coming out of your pocket. Oh, I didn't know that. I, th I thought organisation is accountable. So okay. Both individuals being fined too. Okay. Thank you. I, I didn't know that. Okay, so um, GDPR fines, thank you for um, sharing your thoughts. Um, it's been 56 million euros, but only 50 million euros for Google. So it's not, it's not big. It's nothing. 50 million euros for Google is absolutely nothing, okay? So list goes on, on I mean, look at Four and a half thousand, four thousand eight hundred euros for you know it's it's just uh, unbelievable and and this is quite recently, which ICO um, forced them to to delete. So uh, the fine, have they changed anything? No, they haven't. And also, somebody will get a billion dollar fine. That's a big mistake. Absolutely, and also the fine is. And unfortunately, I mean. Good point because uh, you mentioned about business itself has got other engagements. So IT has got its own engagement. They've got lots of projects in, in hand. They've got non-technical projects like Brexit in, uh, in hand. So they are really, really engaged with lots of things. And this is on top of that. It creates uh, lots of difficulty. Yes, sir. So the ICO actually said that they were going to give one year for bedding in bef before actually uh, starting to dish out the big fines. I know for a fact, because I live in the village where the ICO is, they're trying to scale to actually support all the people that are actually make, uh, putting in, the, uh, putting in the, the claims as well. So all the, case, all the case work that they're having to actually try to investigate, they're scaling through this year to be able to actually start dishing out fines. So I don't expect to see big fines for, for, for corporations because they're, they're going to go big fishing at some point because now the DPA Act 98 didn't have teeth. This one does have Absolutely. teeth. Absolutely. So I'm not expecting to see much, much, many, many fines being issued much before the end of this year, beginning of next. Yeah, it's a, it's a similar story to, um, what's that, banking PPR? Is that big? PPI, sorry, yeah. I, I've always thought of GDPR uh, from that angle. I thought it gives a lots of lots of uh, platform, uh, pr provide a platform to lots of people to actually put their cases. Um. I think the important thing here is it's all about resources as well. Even for the ICO to go out, administer fines, do all of these things, go through the cases, actually requires quite a number of resources to be able to do that. that. And you've got that going across like HMRC and other sort of statutory bodies. So to kind of say, you know, we've got this regulation, which we have, it's, it's actually quite a, like a, a need for a cultural change. So now there's an introduction, there's a bedding in period. It's in people's sort of psyche to do something or to become aware in case they do get you know found out or you know we need to be aware of this this you know this is the gdpr for example even the data protection officers when things happen they're straight away they're on the hook to report the incident because they're on the hook to yeah. do something so you know th without the organization that oh we shall we shall we were you know are we going to get away with this or something so you, so there's a number of different places or or, or situations where Decisions have got to be made by individuals before they, you know, okay, something's happened. Do we report it? Do we tell, you know, the, the ICO about it? Or, or do we tell our customers what do we need to do? Whereas probably the things that happened before were the incidents was data was getting lost. Somebody left their laptop in a car. It got picked up and data was found. And it was almost reported to by, you know, by, by, by the, by the, community or by individuals or the public it wasn't necessarily people sort of just putting their hands up and saying we've done this um so i think you know it, it's sort of going to be cyclic with most other things without other we have other regulations in place this is another one but we have there's a definite need for it i don't just i'm not saying that i just think how 
business are or in terms of implementation and kind of getting on with things mm. um you know for for, a, for an advisory firm where as the project we've given them advice that you need to remove data or delete data if it's over two years old we have a or we have a, a register that tells them what you can do how long you can keep it the situations where you might need to have exemptions but it doesn't stop people printing stuff out and keeping it in their sort of sheds at home yeah so yeah. You know, the, the enforcement is quite a challenge. So as a company or as a project, we have told you what to do. <coughs> the advisory firms within the organisation are almost separate entities. I mean, yes, there's, there's, they've, they've also got, you know, uh, whether they're officers or controllers rights as well. But, you know, trying to explain that all as well as them, again, coming back to resources, really, yeah. what they can well, do. Well, we, we will come to, yeah, re resources is, is, um, as, as a, uh, is important. As I mentioned, organizations, they've got their own projects in, in hand, there are lots of things in hand. Um, the other thing you um, mentioned about the, the, in terms of um, data, data subject, but don't, don't, we shouldn't forget about GDPR. The basis of GDPR, the way it started was I have to bring a politically sensitive topic in the UK, which is human right convention. So the reason we define data subject in, from, in a GDPR framework differently from PIIA, which is NIST defined, an American way, way of the definition of personally identifiable information, is because GDPR extends this data subject definition to, uh, to, to, to many areas which is PIIA hasn't got anything to, to say. So that, that's, that's one of the things when it comes to um, companies, uh, uh, non-EU companies dealing with EU citizens' data. Sometimes, my experience of seeing companies, they just completely missed out this cultural and historical um, background of GDPR. The way GDPR... <coughs> It's the whole idea that the, a person knows what data is held and they can find out and then they can, there's some kind of portability. Yeah. And if you look at the application, for example, in banking and PA, through PhD too, you can literally now have new organizations coming into a bank, of course authorized by whoever owns that data and then giving them new services based yeah. on that data. Yeah. So it's, it's not all the cyber security focus. Of course it's not, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 of, we tend to lose that perspective because uh, all we think of is... Yeah, it's, it, of yeah, it depends on which hat you, uh, that gentleman as a legal point of view defined, you know, of the, his point of view, how, how, how he sees the enforcement of uh, um, uh, uh, co companies to... to um, go back to regulator and explain what, what, ha what has been done. So um, what are the two key problems? <clears throat> Again, based on my experience, I think one of the first thing is organization, they, sh they must be serious about security and data visibility. Because without data visibility, they cannot provide data security. So you, they, have to ha they have to know where this data is and, and how, what type of data they have. So in that sense, they have, they have to constantly handling data um, practices in a way which they can um, guarantee privacy, privacy and security. Uh, um, and and ba the basis of based on the visibility. If they don't have visibility, they can't um, guarantee that. So um, without having proper security tools, so obviously they can't guarantee this data is shared properly uh, and, and, and adequately to uh, di different geographical uh, um, locations or, um, um, or giving um, hand it back to, uh, to data controller or giving to other, other companies, third party companies. So that's, that's I think, in my opinion, there are two, the two key problems area. One is uh, data should be visible, in, and second to be, to, to be secure. So you can't have security without visibility, 
and you can't have visibility without actually finding out what is what is um, uh, your data uh, are and where they are and what sort of data you have. So, sorry. Yeah. Um, the your second statement, uh, I totally agree with, and it is testable. So we should be able to check whether we've got constant data handling practices and, and so on. First one is I can't test whether an organisation is serious about them. You mean in terms of KPIs? There is no yes. Yes. KPIs to no. Do you have answer for that question? If I can help about data visibility, um, if we have carried out data mapping as per Article 30, we, we should know where our data is and it's also a requirement of the law. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we, 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 we also we go to, to the uh, next two slides. It, come, it will um, give you a better view of how you can actually manage the data uh, in terms of visibility. You have, you have a point. Hi, Reza. Um, Hi. We've been carrying out some trend analysis recently uh, over the GDPR trends over the last couple of months. A couple of things we point out is that organizations, we said about data security there, are still really viewing GDPR as an IT issue when it's not. And organizations must be serious, but it goes up higher than that. The board has to be serious about it, and it's got to be owned from the top. So don't think that it's okay, the DPO's dealing with it, the head of IT's dealing with it. It's got to be owned by the board, and with regards to data security and data visibility, it's more than that. It's kind of da it's data ownership, data stewardship. I said that's got to be owned from the top. Thank you, thank you for that. Absolutely. It ha like any other project, it must come and support by, by the board because of the resources requirements, because, of, because this is an organizational issue, this is the business problem. This is the business uh, project, and it's not security. It's not IT, as you just mentioned correctly. You mentioned correctly. This is this should run um, uh, at organize top organizational level, and it involves all business units because they all are uh, sharing personal data, and they they will be involved in that. Um, sorry, I think it's important to recognize that. It, it just to leverage the IT point, um, people that actually focus on the uh, the business process within organisations and stuff like that. If I do, I've got a day book. I use a day book at wherever I go. In here, I hold accounts of people who were in meetings, where they were, who they are, what level of uh, in the organisation that they lose. I lose this. That's a breach. And uh, yeah, so the lady was saying that uh, if they've got printed stuff and they've taken it home. That is still within the data visibility. Yeah, we still got to make sure that we actually know all that. We have to. We have to come to that. That's that's it. that's really important. And uh, it's funny enough because I had to contact ICO about business card. Apparently, if you've got five or six business cards putting into your drawer, it's not. Uh, you're not doing it. There's no GDPR uh, violation in here. But if you put it A to Z, and then Put a rubber band and put it in your uh, um, drill is GDPR violation. Did you know that? Yeah, that's that's what I had to ask them to make sure. Is that correct? Can you? I, maybe you can you can say something about this. So I'll come back to you. Uh, this is a question of jurisdictional scope. Um, so the jurisdiction of the GDPR and the subject matter specifically of that jurisdiction. And uh, obviously, GDPR applies by default to all electronic records and electronic data. But the actually broader principle that underlines it is, is the data organized in a systematic way so that you can uh, you know, access it, create it, update it, delete records from it, and otherwise kind of usefully manage it, essentially, is the idea. So that's a, that's a very good point about how fine these jurisdictions are. But that, I mean, that's, that's, that's a fine example of how jurisdiction can, can get a bit absurd, but, but fundamentally it's about are you organizing it? It's also about the business process. It's not just about the IT. 
It's about like, for example, marketing, right? It's, it's a group in the organization. They need to be told what they can do and what they cannot do. So there's a lot of business process awareness uh, that has to be included into all of this. It's not just about, you know, the data gathering and the saying, we have security on the data or not. I mean, that's the primary of it. The secondary of it is that you have to kind of teach the organization what not to do, uh, how not to use information wrongly, and what is the violation. But it's very innocent for people to be just doing what they're doing without being, and they wouldn't know that it was a violation in the first place. So it's, it's, there's a lot of that aspect of, uh, you know, the uh, data management also has to be kind of included in those parts. Thank you. Do you want to say something? Thank you. Uh, what I wanted to add is that GDPR is applies to organizations. So if you are doing it yourself, you collect cards of people, there is a household exception. So the, the other lawyer could corroborate that in the sense that you're not doing it in, in as, as a company, you're doing it as yourself. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you can collect. Okay. So it, it goes just in, in the way of conducting a business. Uh, the, the, the whole point of, I raised this is which just to um, iterate on that confusion and a lot of com misunderstanding about, about a lot of, lots of things around GDPR and, and also about things you said in terms of business units. So um, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, I have to be quick. Oops, no, not this one. <laughs> okay. Um, we um, said a, a few things about um, privacy and visibility. So we said if you if you want to uh, start securing your data, you have to make sure the date visibility of data is safe. So the the privacy, which I mentioned at the start of the uh, talk, which I said is, is it comes with one of the important pillars of um, GDPR, is against not only data security starts with visibility, the privacy also starts. So you have to have this talk about data inventory with which you mentioned. So you have to have this in place. You have to monitor uh, to see if there is any you know, um, your, um, to, to, to see your vis the visibility of your um, files and, and also to protect them and have a, um, a right audit trail in terms of the use of data in your, um, uh, in your organization. A, a, a very short clip uh, get, taken from The Economist about, about the data. It's very short. Uh, I'll, I'll play this one, but it's not long. Yeah, the user agreement sucks because then again back to the point I've made about we received the lots of privacy uh, notifications. Um, how many of them are written in a very vague language and you don't understand what they're talking about? And and when when it, when this congressman says your use, uh, user agreement sucks, it's just because he doesn't understand it because. He as a user, he doesn't understand. M millions of people don't understand it. So explosion of data is good. It's, uh, it's got lots of good um, uh, benefit for a human being, as uh, we saw that um, doctor was explaining how they, they do. Um, they use uh, intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence using data to, to cure um, someone. But what about the others? What about the dark side of it, which is 
as um, you correctly mentioned, is beyond IT and security because uh, I deliberately put that po about politics, which is beyond everything. Uh, it's, it's very comprehensive, uh, comprehensive uh, in that sense. So, um, just a quick point on about the with the GDPR about being beyond security and IT. Just adding to that is that there's a uh, there's an implication on business insurance cover. And if, if you are not GDPR compliant, then there may be a risk to your business insurance cover, which business leaders will, business, business will, organizations will take notice to. More, more prioritize it than, more, it's more prioritized than privacy may be in some cases. Mm -hmm. So that can provide uh, additional value to businesses, <coughs> which will, they will take seriously. Thank you. Um, I think I have to quickly go through this. Um, there, there are six principles of GDPR um, in, I've divided in here. Um, because short of time, I'll just quickly put the principle. By the way, these, these slides, if you find them useful, they, they um, will be sent to you uh, if, if you want it. I, I'm not quite sure if they're useful to you. but So um, I'm not going through the, these uh, six principles, but what is this three, three uh, principles are actually serving is uh, the accountability. So uh, the, you processed lawfully, you go you collected a specific explicit le legitimate purpose, data should be adequate, relevant, accurate, kept in a form um, which allows um, identification of data subject only and processed in a manner that ensures the, its security. So um, they, they're all serving the accountability of the business, so organizations as a whole. OK, um, this is what I was referring to a few comments about uh, how to manage data risk in GDPR. So um, I've actually put in a four different, uh, in, a, in a four steps, basically, how to prepare um, reluctantly, I used PIA um, rather than data subject, um, but um, I, I, because a lot because the the whole the this one basically comes mainly from uh, NIST. That's why I put PIA to um, to kind of refer to that the, that way of you preparing for um, your the, your data management. Uh, the, uh, addressing security and data management, um, knowing your data, what type of data you have, where they are, who has access to it, and in terms of data security, whether you're on premises, whether you're on cloud, and in terms of compliance, what sort of risk management you have, what sort of automated compliance you have. And then it goes to data protection management, so encryption, tokenizations, uh, classifications, how you monitor your data, how you're doing cloud security, how you monitor your cloud security in terms of uh, using uh, cloud security broker, in terms of shadow IT also, how you, um, and shadow cloud, um, dealing with endpoint protection and mobile endpoint protection, how you use um, advanced threat intelligence in, in order to facilitate your system uh, in 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 uh, in order to uh, to protect your data, and then how you detect uh, your breaches. So what sort of tools you're using to detect your uh, your um, detect uh, your uh, the breach in your system? Uh, so um, uh, in terms of SASP, in terms of shadow SAPs, what tools using to optimize this this process? This is really important because there are lots of tools available, commercial tools available you can use and you can basically detect uh, how your, um, how your uh, network behaves in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, data breach. And then how you respond to this, uh, what sort of um, uh, business continuity plan you've got in place, what sort of reporting, how you evaluate this, how you work with the other parts of business which you mentioned about that, that was really important because when it comes to this, you obviously need to work with uh, many, many parts of business, um, business units. 
You haven't forgotten this, but I think I forgot in my presentation. I, not deliberately, but, and it was about paper based. And it's, uh, I think three people, uh, they uh, agree with me. Uh, they think pa paper based, um, uh, data, data paper based is really uh, difficult for their organization, the process they went through. How many of you are still going through your paper base or on a structured data based on a paper base? One, two, three. You're amazed, only three. But uh, one of the very difficult tasks about this, which kind of relate to this, is the PDF. As you perfectly know, about 60 to 70 percent of files we got are, are PDF files. However, lots of organizations, uh, you, I'm sure Fortune 500, you've been or you are part of that, those companies. Not many people has got the, the right access to um, Acrobat. So what, what is happening is someone printing out the uh, a PDF file. They take it, they do make a, um, changes on, on that pa paper base. And then they go to, um, I think one, uh, the, the last time I, I saw it, that one out of um, 20 people have got the right to access to the uh, Acrobat Reader. A writer, and then they go and they digitize that changes on that document, and then they scan it and put it back on. on a, so, <coughs> you, as you can see, the integrity of data, as you can see, the lots of personal data could have been exposed on a printer. Then you put that print, take it home, you put it in a, on a bin. So, um, still a, a lot of work requires to uh, to basically respond to paper based which sometimes the journey is uh, uh, back and forth. It's electronic, on a structure, electronic uh, a version of uh, a file goes to the print, come back, and then back to, back to the electronic version. So paper is, is, is the important part. OK, just to remind us about data subject rights. The right to access, the right to be forgotten, and the, all of these rights, which the lawyer's um, uh, job for us now to this. But you have to, you have to be, as, uh, if, if you're a security practitioner, if you are a business practitioner, marketing, or any other part of business, you need to all the time make sure this is, this is served as part of GDPR. And uh, okay, what lesson we've we've learned? Uh, just summarize. Uh, what we've learned is we need to adapt new requirements. So new requirements in terms of legal requirements, in terms of security requirements, in terms of from organizational point of view, which basically uh, goes into into the uh, the change management process. So we need to review and rewrite. Uh, any policies because GDPR is not a destination but, but a journey. It's like security, it's not a destination, it's a journey. So it needs opt up to be updated, it needs to be re revisited and look at because the way business could change the way business runs. So you may have three geographical position in, in Singapore uh, and they move them, you move them to Netherlands. So they all um, Change, changes the way we deal with GDPR. This is again an important part because, because in my opinion, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure um, how many of you. I think this is the key. This is this is your uh, key to GDPR success. So if you do DPIA successfully, effectively, you've done lots of lots of the job you need to do in terms of GDPR. So you need to check. And plan and consistent uh, and be consistent in terms of your auditing and risk assessment. Work with your risk committee quite closely. This is what I've learned again myself. This this is absolutely difficult part. I was um, asked for a, a financial um, uh, company. It's it's quite quite big. I think the revenue around 500 million 
pounds. They wanted to outsource their Apple devices to a technology company. And, and that technology company, uh, I think John knows about that, because John, I was, I was talking to John. Yeah, I, I, I helped them to kind of facilitate this with that technology company. And technology company, very good bunch of technical people. They knew what they were doing. But they, in terms of IT governance maturity, zero. They had absolutely no policy, written policy, nothing. They were really good the, the way they were doing their job, but not uh, uh, from, from a security and from an IT governance point of view. So it is really important because, because, event, uh, because in terms of accountability, the accountability will be shared with you as a, uh, as a data controller to data processor. So again, budget planning resources. Someone mentioned, mentioned about, I think you mentioned about this, which is really important. It's not, uh, but budget is important and other resources, working closely with the, with the uh, board about this. And when it comes to this, training, training, training. Where was that uh, Tony Blair about education, 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 yeah? Training, training, training. Because everyone at any level, they need training all the time to update themselves with with, uh, with this. And the lesson learned about data breaches, um, again, back because of the, requires a lots of resources in terms of companies respond to breaches, to go to ICU and explain. So make sure you've got the right technology, the right expertise in terms of how to detect breaches comprehensively, quickly, uh, effectively, and to um, uh, report them back. Um, in terms of your capabilities, in terms of your threat intelligence, this is this is again really important because, as you uh, well know, in terms of how the cyberspace changed, the behavior of cyberspace uh, and the the, the 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 threat landscape, we really need this to be to be um, uh, looked at quite uh, comprehensively, and 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 th this is again. Important is important in real time. It's just because you've got 72 hours to report, and and also it's good because it's good for your security posture because then you can quickly respond to to uh, any incidents comes, and not like um, Yahoo. They didn't know. I think four years they found that after four years, and I was amazed they haven't even used an encryption. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, tra um, uh, AI and machine learning completely changed this. Uh, it, it, it does help in that, that sense. <laughs> this, is, this is again back to in the uh, be responsive uh, quickly. Uh, one, of, one of the things I, I forgot to put in one of, uh, one of these uh, slides was uh, when, when you um, faced with data legacy and application legacy. Because again, I was involved in uh, application integration for a, a, a financial company, uh, which was a, was a massive, massive uh, project. So they call it digital transformation. A lot, when it comes to data legacy, the visibility issue, again, is an issue. It's a bigger issue. Because uh, lots of data, you don't, they don't know. No one knows where they, this data is. And, and that's, that's important. So when, it, when you've got any project in terms of uh, t things like uh, integration or cl cloud uh, transformation, it is important to look at your um, data legacies and, and application legacies from a GDPR point of view, not uh, from other, um, other matters. So um, again, don't forget your paper records because that's really important. Uh, again, back to that PDF things because it's keep uh, coming back to me. I, I see every day in terms of PDF, people just print and do changes. And um, I think we don't have time for any discussion. We had discussion um, during, the, during the presentation. And we can take our, um, any discussion out of this room. Thank you for tolerating me for about an hour. Uh, I hope um, I... Uh,
uh, managed to kind of bring all of these uh, views and, and lessons we've learned from uh, GDPR into, into, the, into something which all of us can learn. And, and also this presentation, a slide available, uh, it's um, been recorded. You, if you're a member of BCS, you can have access to that. Uh, if you're not a member of BCS, I'm afraid you don't have. If you think the slides are, um, are uh, useful, so you can, you can have it. Just for one, uh, quickly, I found this in my, when I came in here. Uh, I'm not reading the name, president of uh, one of the SG groups with lots of personally identifying information in here. So, as you can see, uh, it's a clear and present danger. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reza. Um, we've probably got time for one or two questions, if there are any, but I think we've done pretty well getting through the questions as we've been going along. So, um, if that's the case, and without further ado, I'm going to say this is the point of the evening where I would um, normally say, and with great thanks, Reza, for doing that lovely talk, here is your present. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> your empty hat. Uh, minor glitch in that um, uh, Reza gets the choice of a BCS book, and... Um, we, we didn't get his choice, so <laughs> we, we will have to follow it up. Um, but he, he will definitely get his present. So so just another reminder of the next event, which is um, Carolyn and Kev on the June the 11th, which is about supply chain management. And I think that that um, probably... Oh, Probably haven't got enough anything else written on here. So uh, again, for the final final thanks to Reza for his uh, efforts, um, Thank you. we shall adjourn outside. Just put this back before anyone finds them. <laughs> oh, and if anybody wants to talk to me about the CMA event next week, then they certainly might. It's not really a handout, it's, oh. it's what I produced for the event, which is a sort of history of the CMA. But okay.